The Art in the Thumbnail is brought to you by the extraordinarily talented hands and mind of Christian of Prehistorica. He's an amazing paleo artist and ancient invertebrate expert. If you fancy his work, then follow him on Twitter or subscribe to his channel here on YouTube. Lagerstatten is the scary German word given to any type of sedimentary rock deposit which preserves almost every part of the critters fossilized in that rock. There are plenty known from around the world, and they span the entire rock record, so the earliest Lagerstaten are the most important to our understanding of the evolution and origin of life on Earth. Most organisms from the Cambrian period, a good 541 to 485 million years ago, were soft-bodied. In other words, they had no hard shells, no bones, no beaks that would fossilize once their squishy bodies decayed away to sludge. Those ooey-gooey mini-beasts are only readily captured in the fossil record in those Lagerstaten I mentioned. Each one offers a hugely important box of puzzle pieces used to unblur the origin of complex life on Earth. The Chengjiang Lagerstadt of eastern Yunnan province, China, preserves a ton of soft-bodied animals from 10 million years before the Burgess Shale, the more famous deposit of Cambrian weirdos in Canada. This makes the Chengjiang even more important to the study of the diversification of complex organisms during the Cambrian period. It seems like a lot of early arthropods found a bivalved body plan extremely useful in their lives. There were a ton of lineages in the Chengjiang that took on this bivalved body. A body where there are two halves of armor, or where their body has a hinge between two halves. One of the many creepy crawlies carrying a bivalved helmet over the front of its body was quite distinct from its peers. This is Urgicaris minusculo. It's extremely tiny, just 10 to 13 millimeters long. This carpenter ant-sized little critter has a shield over the front of its body that is roughly divided into two lobes. Most arthropods like Urgicaris have a hinge between the two shields, but this guy doesn't. It's just a big hammer-headed shield. Another thing making these critters stand out is their eyes. They have a single pair of black spots embedded in the top of their head shield. The most closely related arthropods from the same rock layers all have eyes on stalks. Urgicaris also has a long segmented body ending in a telson, the anatomical term for the tail. Altogether, these guys are looking a lot like the stand producing arrow of a certain series of extraordinary experiences, or even the boomerang headed amphibian, Diplocolis. Why did it have such a bizarre head? The authors who described Urgicaris found it showed all the hallmarks of a nectobenthic lifestyle. Nectobenthic comes from nectonic and benthic, with nectonic meaning a critter that swims and benthic a critter that stays on the bottom. Therefore, Urgicaris was likely a critter that swam around the interface between the water and the bottom of the sea. This is because it had eyes facing upwards and a mouth pointed down towards the sand. It had a fin-shaped tail and a long body that would have made it relatively good at swishing up and down to move from one spot to another. Large walking legs or feeding appendages weren't preserved in the fossils, so if it had any, they weren't very strong or useful. Therefore, the most likely explanation was that the critter was a deposit feeder. This arrow-shaped fish shrimp pretty much did as the crabs do and munched mouthfuls of sand to sift out any yummy bits that might be in there. Some of the Urgicaris fossils preserve the gut, which was a very simple tube. Some even have their poop preserved in a little cylindrical turd at the very end of the simplistic poop shoot. Like, most Cambrian animal guts had extra little pockets called diverticulae or midglands that helped them further digest any good bits. Not the case for our little friend here. They just consume sand, absorb nutrients, expel sand, become crab. Urgicaris' lack of definitive features makes it difficult to slap in a specific evolutionary grouping besides arthropoda, which is the absolutely enormous clade grouping together the arachnids, insects, senti and millipedes, crustaceans, and everything in between and beyond. So, the researchers who described the remains didn't go more in depth than that. 
It does, however, share some similarities with Clipicaris and Schwan Dianella, both of which come from similar-aged rocks in the same general region. As you can see, they all look a bit penish-ish, with a double bivalved head and a long tube ending in a fin. These other guys have movable eyes and hinges between the armor though, so you know, whatever. They're all weird, okay? But is this really correct? Are we looking at the fossil as the animal was before it died? Or has the body changed after death? Clipicaris and Urchicunia are the most similar invertebrates to Urchicaris. Like I said, the Urchicaris research team nominated them as the closest known relative. Here's the catch. If you take the bivalved armor of Clipicaris and pull it apart a bit, give it a little flare out, you'll get a fossil that's visually indistinct from the hammer-headed Urchicaris fossils. So does that mean they are the same animal? Perhaps the bodies labeled Urgicaris are just Clipicaris bodies after a period of time after death. Perhaps they just decompose like that. What might be the evidence to prove this suspicion? A ton of Clipicaris fossils preserved in somewhat of a similar fashion to the Urgicaris, of course. Are there? <laughs> yup. Look, here's one labeled Clipicaris. It has its bivalves flared out in a similar but less obnoxious fashion to the Urgicaris fossils. If we take a look at the Urgicaris fossils, you notice that the body segments in the front half of the body are shortened compared to those in the last half of the body, leading into the tail fin. These shortened segments should tell you that they were distinct from the rest of the segments. Why would they be distinct like this if Urgicaris just flopped its body up and down to swim? Coincidence? I think not! These shortened segments should indicate that this part of the body was covered in the bivalved armor that was squished outwards as the bodies fossilized. Turns out, the angle at which the body falls onto the ocean bottom, the time between death and burial, the time between burial and fossilization, and the angle of the body at the time of fossilization are all factors that change how the body looks once it's become a fossil. This makes a whole bunch of weird variations of the typical penis-shaped bivalved fish shrimp. How do we prove this? CT scans, unfortunately. So until someone throws these fossils through a CT scanner, we won't know for sure. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, hit the bell icon for updates, like this video, and drop a comment in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my elephant tier patrons, Thea Svensson, Staniforth Hopkins, Dinosaur, and Arda Bayer, as well as my Tyrannosaurus tier patrons, Henry Brennan, Danny Van Heck, Dana Manchester, Chris Frampton, and Admin.